Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all do doing well this morning. Thank you for joining this morning's partner webinar on security and the evolving workplace. My name's Isaac. I'm a business development account manager here at ADM, and I'll be monitoring the chat and making sure the webinar all goes smoothly. We have a fantastic speaker lined up for you this morning, WatchGuard security expert Ollie Venn. And before I hand over to Ollie, I would like to kick off with a little bit of information for those who don't know who we are at ADM Computing. So we are a IT services and support company. We're based in Kent, covering London, South East and further. We were established in 1984, which makes us around 36 years old now. And we have 70 staff, three quarters of whom are technical and service delivery teams. We're also a Microsoft Gold partner and a highly rated partner with many other industry leading vendors, including WatchGuard. We are also ISO 9001, 14001, 27001 and Cyber Essentials Plus accredited. So that's just a little bit of information about us. If you have any more questions about us, feel free to send over an email or pop in the chat. And just before I go, I'd like to encourage you all to ask any questions you have in the Q&A box, which you can find in the bottom right of your screen. Dependent on time, we will answer these questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'd now hand you over to our WatchGuard security expert, Oli Venn. Hi, good morning. Yeah, thank you, Isaac, and yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak to to everybody that's uh, that's here today. So, yeah, I am Ollie Venn. I'm one of the sales engineers for WatchGuard here in the UK and Ireland. Uh, I've been with WatchGuard for around two and a half years now, but actually prior to that, um, was a WatchGuard customer for around eight years. So I was an end user for a, um, a distributed enterprise uh, with 37 sites across the uh, UK and Ireland. So I've lived and breathed and now uh, worked with the product. Um, so could say I have a thing for, uh, for, for WatchGuard uh, for the last 10 or so years. So uh, yeah, we're going to have a look at the um, the slides today um, where we're going to talk around security and the evolving workplace. Um, obviously, it's a very key topic for us uh, for us now. So let me get started with a bit of information, really. Um, we've run recently this survey uh, in partnership with SC Media UK. Um, basically, with a huge surge of remote workers, uh, we understand that IT teams are now under severe pressure to make sure their systems are safe. So this survey um, was basically to think or to see what UK businesses think um, are the major cyber threats um, to their businesses and investigates uh, if they have the necessary solutions, skills and support in place to protect against those cyber attacks. Um, so we're actually seeing 86% uh, of businesses expected cyber threats to increase over the next 12 months, which is quite a huge um, worry for, for everybody out there. Um, and, and the worrying things with that as well is that half of you had actually experienced some form of attack in the last 12 months, 44% of you. Um, and pretty alarmingly, actually, as 11% were unsure if you'd even experienced an attack or not. And that number is, is, is quite scary. So we asked what were the, the greatest cyber threats to your business and at number one was phishing and it's quite easy to understand why phishing attacks are getting more sophisticated we're seeing larger volumes um, and and that's kind of what we're seeing too uh, across the world is that phishing attacks are on the rise um, there is a report run by google which um, sort of freedom of information from Google and they show that there's a huge rise in phishing attacks um, and phishing sites being hosted on the internet. Um, in second place is actually authentication attacks and stolen credentials which kind of ties into the phishing piece. I, I see these both as one um, because generally phishing attacks are there to steal credentials. Once they've got those user credentials they can then use it in attack. So that's kind of where they go hand in hand. And then obviously we've got things like ransomware which um, has, has been an issue for a number of years now and obviously we saw the devastating impact to the sort of NHS with WannaCry um, and nobody wants that in their organisation. Um, interestingly uh, we've got fileless malware and remote employees um, as high up there as well uh, for concerns. And we asked what the next question we asked was what's the biggest barrier to improving your organisation's um, security um, and time and budget. Now, budget comes up every single year. IT, unfortunately, never get enough budget for what they want. Um, it's it's been the same uh, for as long as I've been in IT, 20 odd years now. That budget has generally been the, the number one concern. But interestingly, in uh, in close second is the the skills and the tools along with that time. Um, and I think that's where 
people like ADM can really help out. It's no um, no surprise really that every organization will suffer with the the skills shortage and that gap especially in today's evolving world where cyber threats are getting more sophisticated and complicated and harder to detect and uh, and prevent that's why we rely on great service partners like ADM who can offer that that skill set to to improve your uh, your organization's security at WatchGuard, we have a, a team called our threat uh, research team, our threat lab, um, and every uh, quarter they will run a process where they, they analyze what threats we've seen from the firewalls, what we're predicting, etc. Uh, we have a security blog, uh, which is called secplicity.org. Um, I highly recommend everybody checking it out. There is a, a newsletter available there either daily or weekly to sign up to. Uh, if you're interested in getting cybersecurity news and seeing what's going on across the world um, in terms of threats that we're, we're seeing and stopping. From the last quarter, so this is quarter two of 2020, um, we saw a decrease in the amount of fireboxes reporting to us. Now there is a tick box that say, hey, send anonymous data to WatchGuard, and that's what we're using to, to populate this information. Um, we saw a decrease in that mainly because of people turning off businesses and firewalls, et cetera, um, due to unfortunate COVID. Um, and in line with that, we've also seen that the gateway antivirus is dropped in the, the increase in detections. Uh, sorry, the detections have decreased by around 24%. However, the APT service and the intelligent AV have both seen an increase in what we class, class as zero day hits. So let me just rewind a little bit and explain that a bit further. So. Gateway antivirus uses a signature based method to detect viruses and malware. These are what we call known malware. Basically, they they're relying on a signature to identify the type of malware it is. So whether that's WannaCry, NotPetya, Emoted, etc, etc. Unknown zero day malware is where the malware has not been seen in the wild before. So these traditional AV methods are unable to detect it. And what we've seen from a worldwide view is that 67% of all malware stopped at the firewall has actually been classified as zero day. So this is where we've had to use advanced techniques using the APT blocker, which is a sandboxing service, and intelligent AV, which is using machine learning and AI to determine the probability of it being malicious, rather than to say, hey, this is Mimikatz or it's WannaCry, et cetera. Now this is quite a staggering um, number, 67%. And in the UK, it's it's actually significantly higher. When we filter it via the UK, it's normally in the mid 80s, um, but can be topical. So uh, when WannaCry, uh, sorry, well not when WannaCry, when COVID first started spreading uh, in in March and it was gaining media attention, we were seeing that these uh, sort of malware writers, etc., were targeting um, people with this impersonating so like COVID trackers and we saw an increase in, in zero day and we were actually up to 93 94 percent at times in uh, in early March where this was starting to spread so this is why we need to to look at sort of advanced techniques um, and we've seen the drop in the traditional gateway antivirus because unfortunately they're getting more sophisticated so let's have a look at some of the notable attacks um, the top one is is uh, the SQL injection and the cross-site scripting. This is sort of targeting web services hosted behind the firewall. Um, and the threat actors are continually targeting these, these web resources. Um, a new addition actually to the top 10 was the, um, in terms of network volume was an XML um, vulnerability uh, targeting WordPress and Drupal. Um, and basically this, um, it was it targeting a six year old vulnerability as well, but has been reignited recently just because there's so many systems out there that just haven't been patched. People deploy these systems and then just kind of forget about them and, and don't patch them in the background. So that's why it's important to make sure you keep up to date with patching because something from 2014 is now reemerging as one of the top threats again. Um, and then we continue to see as well the, the brute force login. So this is where people are using like password spraying techniques to try and hack into remote services. So basically anything that's publicly available um, that requires a username and password, we're seeing brute force attacks to get into those over and over again. And I'll explain a little bit on how we can uh, protect ourselves with those. Um, a survey that was recently done for Forbes shows that pre-pandemic, um, there was actually a rise in, in remote workers. So around 40% uh, 
um, 38% um, of, of organizations were allowing remote workers. Um, but during the pandemic, this has actually risen to almost 80%. Um, and also we're seeing that they're saying now after the pandemic or if the pandemic ever returns to normality, they're still going to continue this remote working. 44% of organizations expect, almost 50%, expect to see the, the levels of remote working today continuing into the future. So this actually uh, then brings us to the sort of office downsizing. Um, I was speaking to somebody in, I think it was January, February time this year, and they were looking at replacing their firewall solution because they were looking at new buildings basically and, and we're sort of on about doubling the size of their business on the, the office space because of the amount of staff that they're taken on over the last year or so and they, they, their organization had just expanded um i actually caught up with them last week and said how's things going are you still looking at moving what's the plans now and they said oh yeah yeah we're still moving but they're actually downsizing now. They realized that 90% of their workforce could work from home and they were just as productive at home as they were in the office. So now that they're, they're taking the approach to, hang on a minute, we can have some cost savings here. Why double the size of the building when we can actually reduce the size um, and save ourselves some overhead? And I think that's gonna be a, um, a key thing um, for moving forward. P businesses are gonna want to reduce their costs and reduce the overheads and downsizing is, is definitely gonna be one of those and enabling that remote workforce to uh, to carry on working. And we'll have a look at some solutions as to how we can uh, protect those. Which takes me on to the next piece, which is protecting that evolving workplace. So WatchGuard, if you don't know, um, have a family of Firebox appliances. It's the same operating system from the very smallest devices all the way up to the largest uh, rack mount appliances. So whether it's a handful of users up to you know, seven and a half, eight thousand users, we have an appliance that will, will cope and it's the same appliance across it all. So uh, once you know WatchGuards, you know them all. We also have some virtual appliances so they can run in Hyper-V and VMware and we have uh, public cloud uh, appliances available as well. So in AWS and Azure, so giving you multiple options. And one of those options could be something like this. So today your environment may look like this. You have that remote worker at the top who's connected in via VPN um, to your firewall. Doesn't have to be a WatchGuard firewall currently, but it's a, a good place in a WatchGuard demo to put a WatchGuard firewall there. And then you have your on-site uh, resources behind. What we've seen with the pandemic is, um, is people shifting towards the cloud, maybe AWS or Azure, um, or some other kind of private cloud where they're hosting VMware or Hyper-V. Um, having 100 users behind a firewall is a certain load on the firewall, obviously. But if you put those 100 users remote and get them all to VPN into the network firewall, um, that firewall's actually got to work harder because it's then got to decrypt all of those VPN connections as well as processing their traffic normally. So it's actually more of a load for the firewall. So what we saw is people shifting to a model like this where they're using a WatchGuard firewall in AWS or Azure or something in a private cloud, getting the remote user to VPN into that cloud infrastructure and then having a branch of this VPN from that to your on-prem resources so they can still um, do their productivity, um, access servers, etc., everything that they're supposed to be doing without any sort of constraints on bandwidth and CPU and memory load, etc., on that on-prem firewall. But what we're now starting to see as this pandemic is going on longer is people shifting to a model like this, where that remote worker is still remote, they're VPN into the cloud, but actually people are now starting to shift their resources to the cloud as well, their infrastructure to the cloud in that environment and moving away from the, the on-prem approach. That way they can then also downsize um, the on-prem infrastructure in, further, in future rather, um, and it's just reducing the overhead and the requirement for the uh, the on-prem infrastructure and just adopting the, uh, the cloud. And we've definitely seen significant rises uh, in this over the last few months. So I'm going to have a talk around a, uh, a product that we brought out last year. Uh, you may not have heard of this. Um, you may not have come across it yet. Um, it, it's basically called WatchGuard Passport, and it's it's all about the security that travels with the users. Even pre-pandemic, we were seeing that, that users were, were getting remote. 
Um, so basically, Passport is a an easy to buy bundle of, of user fo focused security services. It's always on. Um, it's going to follow the user wherever they are. So whether that's at home, in a coffee shop, in a hotel, it's going to work just as well. It's cloud based, so it's security as a service. There's no uh, hardware infrastructure required to be deployed, and it offers free levels of protection. So authentication, making sure that they're not just relying on a username and password to access publicly available resources, offering protection and response to any kind of threats as well. So these slides actually, and I like to keep them in because they were, they were actually created pre-pandemic before we even saw what was going to happen with remote working. And basically back then we were seeing 92% of organizations allowed some form of remote working. And, and we were actually seeing on average 40% of work was now being performed remotely as well. And 80% expected some increase in remote working. I don't think they expected it to the levels that it has actually become, um, but we've definitely seen that increase in remote working. And that's why we have Passport to protect those users, regardless of where they are. And it's addressing all of the top security concerns. So things like the happy clickers, clicking on phishing emails, um, ransomware, malware and credential threat. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at how we can do those. So the authentication is basically securing that remote workforce. So we believe if you have a credential that's publicly available, so you're logging into whether it's Office 365, a VPN connection, anything where you're using a single username and password to log into a resource, that should be protected with MFA um, to make sure that those credentials haven't been breached or, or stolen. Um, DNS. Uh, protection and end user protection is uh, is for the endpoint, so it's going to block things like phishing attempts. If you're an existing watch, watch guard customer today and you've got DNS watch on the firewall, you'll know that this is a DNS level firewalling that can offer protection for those uh, for those users if they click a phishing link. And it works by instead of just giving them a blocked page, it redirects them to a training portal to give them in the moment training. There's no better time to teach a user than when they've just made a mistake. So it takes them through how to identify a phishing attempt. So hopefully the next time a phishing email comes through, they just take a moment back to actually understand what's happened and don't click that link. It will also offer uh, protection from uh, sort of ransomware and malware where the DNS is the first protocol. Um, if if a user has a link, the very first thing it's got to do is a DNS lookup. So we can stop it at that, um, offering greater protection. And then we've got an endpoint solution, uh, an endpoint EDR solution, detection and response, which basically is able to detect those new zero day type threats with machine learning, office cloud sandboxing, and even a 100% attestation service. So we can guarantee what is running on that machine is perfectly leg legitimate. Let's have a look at some of the, the problems that we need to solve. So mobile users are more susceptible than ever to click a phishing link. If they're remote, they're maybe not having the pressure of being in the office. They get an email come through, they're more likely to click it. And also on things like social media, et cetera, they're more likely to, to click them then. Ransomware is becoming more sophisticated and spreads much easy, more, more easily. In fact, there was one uh, earlier this year called Emoted, which was even scanning nearby Wi-Fi. So if you have a device that's infected, it will use that device to then probe near Wi-Fi uh, networks and try and brute force hack those Wi-Fi to then get in and spread that ransomware as well. So it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, credentials being stolen, um, they account for a huge proportion of attacks. And ultimately the users, they're the first line of defense and off, often the uh, the weakest. So we can fix the, the phishing issue with DNS Watch Go. This offers protection both on and off the network uh, with that DNS firewalling. With, uh, with our EDR solution, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is, uh, is preventing those threats and only allowing known goodware to run. So we don't have to take that risk of allowing a process until we actually know what it is. And with all point, we can secure those credentials to make sure that they are protected. So we're not relying on the user anymore. Passport is offering that, that great protection. So our, our uh, EDR solution is a product called Panda AD360. Um, now, for those that aren't aware, um, Panda um, are now a WatchGuard brand. We acquired them earlier on this year, um, March time, just as everything was kicking off. 
Um, and when I first heard that we were acquiring Panda, I was like, mm, OK, I've kind of heard the name, but don't really know a lot about them. Um, so I, I did my own investigation. Um, I wanted to know what this product was, what it could do, et cetera. And I was mightily impressed. Uh, they've been around for 30 odd years now. Um, they've been inspired by the technology changes and definitely focus on the B2B. Um, they were actually the first cloud engine, um, it's scanning engine in 2007. Um, in 2012, they moved to a sole cloud uh, environment, so there's no need for on-prem infrastructure to, to manage it. And they actually launched, um, they were the first vendor actually to launch an EDR. So this is a new way of thinking um, for antivirus and no longer relying on a signature to detect and respond to a threat. They were able to, uh, to, to do this back in 2015 and it's just grown since then. Um, in 2019, they ended up winning the, the Gartner Peer for uh, Gartner Insight here for, for EDR technology. So let's have a quick look at what the, the differences are between the traditional antivirus and the adaptive defense 360. The traditional AV will use um, signature files and heuristics to identify known malware. So it's not able to detect that unknown. It's, um, it's and it's only able to detect that known malware and very close uh, variants of it. It's only going to tell you about things that it knows are bad because it doesn't know anything else. Um, and it's kind of offering that basic form of protection. Um, will give you no insight into the type of attack as well. So it can't tell you if it's probed the network resources, whether it's spread itself to anywhere else. Um, and it's only going to be able to stop that known process, but it doesn't monitor any kind of process activity that's that's associated with it as well. So the Adaptive Defense 360 um, is a new approach. It's based on uh, intelligence. So we're using a lot of big data uh, and machine learning to identify uh, threats, whether they're known or unknown, and basically classify those accordingly. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're APT, so advanced persistent threats, fileless attacks, or any type of malicious behavior, really. Um, it's continuously managing 24-7, uh, monitoring logs and categorizing 100% of the running processes. Even if they're initially trusted, um, we will keep it, uh, monitoring those to make sure that they suddenly don't take a side turn in calling malware, etc. Um, it's prevention, detection and remediation. It's going to give you this detailed forensic information so it can tell you, hey, this process is malicious, but it was started by this process. So we've also stopped that process and also maybe it spread itself through this network port, etc. It will give you a full map of what's going on with that and making sure that you can remediate and maybe understand where it's come from to prevent it from happening again. Um, and, and that's all included in that, in that sort of endpoint visibility. So it's really powerful service. So a traditional AV would kind of look like this. Um, it knows the, the malware uh, and it knows the suspicious. Um, obviously, it doesn't know the unknown, and this is a huge risk for us. It's allowing things that are unknown to, to run, which obviously contains a lot of risk. Um, and it requires generally traditional AV more effort to scan the uh, suspicious process. So this is why we can see sometimes with traditional AV that they can be high memory and CPU um, efforts to try and detect further things um, and, and causing sort of endpoint performance. Our model is different to that. Basically, we, we run it on a classification of absolutely all running processes. Um, it's all, pro, uh, all programs that will run in real time um, and they're actually verified by a managed service, which gives you a higher level of protection. So if we look at this, we see um, obviously we, we can move that, that more risk because it's unknown to a known. So we classify everything. So we know that it is good and we can allow it to run and it's also reducing the overhead. There is sometimes a very small portion of stuff that can't happen automatically. So we're not relying on AI and machine learning to deliver that. And I think it's something like 0.07% requires human intervention. That will then get sent off to somebody uh, in the Panda team who will analyze that process and manually check it and be like, yes, this is good or no, it's bad. And depending on the result of that, we will either automatically allow it or we'll automatically block it for you. So there's no interruption to your service um, and it can work on everything. There's basically nothing's going to run on that endpoint unless we know it is in this good green uh, green goodware section. The DNS Watch Go, like I said, is all about 
protecting from like fishing attacks. Um, generally, most attacks start with a fish, um, and it's the same protection uh, on prem. Uh, behind the firewall using DNS Watch is what we've now delivered via DNS Watch Go. So it's offering that remote user protection. Obviously, you're adding in things like content filtering as well. So when you're on site and you're behind the firewall, you can create policies to to filter, making sure that people aren't going to malicious sites, adult content, etc. You may want to add that in for your remote users as well. So you can offer content protection at a DNS level and also that integrated security awareness. So if somebody's at home and they click a phishing link, on their uh, corporate device, we we'll redirect them to a training portal to offer that in the moment training. And then all point is all around that uh, MFA solution. So um, passwords are basically offering a fast pass into your network. The number one action used in breaches is actually stolen credentials. Um, the number of breaches that leveraged either stolen or weak credentials was 81%. And the number one malware in 2019, 2018, and we're seeing it again in 2020, is Mimikatz, which sole purpose is there to steal credentials. And the reason they're doing this is because if you've got somebody's credentials, you've got a fast access into their network. So I just want to quickly talk around some uh, some of the security threats um, that, that you need to be aware of. So uh, you may have heard it in the news last year, uh, where Facebook mistakenly stored millions of users' passwords in plain text. Um, yeah, wonder why you have to worry? Well, the chances are those users are probably using the same password and maybe even the same email address for their social side as what they are for the corporate environment as well. So no, a hacker wouldn't need to decrypt that information. It's all stored in plain text, and then they can use those passwords to try and gain access to your resources. Uh, Citrix in March last year as well, the FBI actually advised that um, hackers were able to get into uh, quite a few Citrix environments, basically using a brute force or password spraying attack where they would try multiple weak passwords over and over again in different environments, usernames, etc. And they were able to successfully infiltrate various Citrix environments. Um, Reddit's an interesting one. They were breached uh, back in 2018. Um, but they were using an SMS solution. Now they kind of assumed that they were safe um, because they were using 2FA, which is relying on SMS tokens. Um, and in fact, it's it's unfortunately really easy to redirect an SMS message, um, whether that's through malware, SIM swap, SIM redirection, etc. There's various techniques to be able to uh, intercept that SMS message from uh, to the mobile device. And it's kind of like having a, a lock on your front door, not realizing that multiple people have got the same key to, as you. So, and there's nothing worse than uh, than having a false sense of security in, in IT. And that's definitely what happened in the Reddit case. They thought they were safe with SMS 2FA. And unfortunately, the hackers were still able to get in and steal a lot of their data. And then finally, one that I like to bring up, especially in current times, is the Home Depot case. Um, this goes back to 2014, um, but it's still relevant to today. And this was a third party contractor have VPN access into the Home Depot network to do some work. Um, but that third party contractor's credentials became uh, breached and stolen and uh, a malicious hackers were able to get in using those credentials and steal a ton of information, credit card information, addresses, etc. And that actually ultimately resulted in a twenty seven million dollar settlement for Home Depot uh, three years ago now. So this slide just sort of rehomes that all it takes to gain access um, to your network, regardless of whether you've got the, the best remote access or the best firewall on the market, all it's going to take is one user with a bad password, somebody with key loggers or somebody sharing their password or OTP. So no matter what resource it is, it should be protected with MFA. Let's have a quick look at some of the, the use cases for MFA as well uh, and how it actually fits in with the environment. So logging into a Windows machine or a Mac OS, etc., cetera, um, whether that's a laptop, PC, server, can be protected with uh, MFA. So the user would log in using their normal credentials and password, and they then just get shown a uh, an auth point page where they can send themselves a push, scan a QR code, one-time password. And this even works whilst offline as well. Um, so you don't require the uh, the device to be online uh, to be able to authenticate. The experience for VPNs. So uh, obviously everybody working from home, if you're using a VPN, you want to be securing that as well. Um, if you're familiar with the WatchGuard mobile VPN SSL client, it looks very much like this. 
you would type in your username and password on the left, hit connect, it would show you the connecting. And then on the user's device over on the right hand side, they would just receive a push message. Hey, you're trying to sign in, do you approve or deny? Um, obviously, if they are trying to sign in, they would then just hit approve. It can be used for many remote solutions as well, things like uh, Citrix Netscaler in this particular case. So if you've got those remote solutions, wanting people to, to log into that, maybe you're moving to a, a VDI environment, um, this can offer that kind of protection. And then the best feature I like, well, one of the features I really like about the, uh, the Authpoint MFA is the ability to securely authenticate once, but access any of your cloud-based resources. So I would go to a page, uh, it's authpoint.watchguard.com forward slash my company name. I would log in using my username, email address, whatever, password, hit send push, and I would then get the push come through to my mobile device, approve it. And what I will actually then get is a single sign on page, which gives me access to all of my cloud based resources. So I can then just click on these and it will seamlessly authenticate me in the background. So I don't have to go in and log into each one of these. Um, and this works for many so most software as a service, cloud-based applications, things like Office 365, Salesforce, G Suite, GoToMeeting, Zoom, etc. Many, many resources out there that this offers protection for. So the user doesn't need to remember lots of username and password for all of those resources. They just log in once using one username and password, authenticate with that push message, and then click on these and it will seamlessly log them in. I personally love this feature. Um, at WatchGuard, we've got about 12 different cloud-based resources. And if I had to log into each one of those, maybe different passwords, et cetera, then accept a push every single time, it would just be a logistical nightmare for me. And especially my IT team, having to manage several hundred users or with 12 different cloud applications, it just becomes a, a huge task. With this, they don't have to worry about those passwords now for all of these resources. It's all done for the identity portal um, and uh, works really nicely. So let's go back and have a look at those breaches. So the Home Depot case, uh, if that third party contractor had received a push message um, saying, hey, you're trying to sign into the VPN, they would have gone, no, I'm not, hit deny. That would have just saved $27 million to Home Depot just by pushing deny. Um, and it would have never happened. Uh, same with Reddit. Um, unlike an SMS, uh, MFA using a push base is encrypted to the mobile app and it can't be intercepted or redirected. So it is secure. Uh, it prevents that from actually happening. And again, the user would have received a push message. Hey, you're trying to sign in. No, I'm not. Deny. And then it would have prevented that leak. Same with Citrix. We wouldn't have needed an FBI investigation to understand how so many Citrix accounts have been breached. They would have received a push message, hit denied, and know that they've got a weak password and then time to change it. And we wouldn't need to worry about things like Facebook, storing our usernames and passwords in clear text, because if somebody tried to use those in anything, we would get a push message, hit deny, we're now protected, and maybe time to change the password. It just takes me on to my final segment, which is to talk about the, the threat of the dark web. Um, the um, Basically, hackers are constantly finding ways of stealing data because they can monetize it and they make money from it by selling it through the dark web. So information like email accounts, usernames and passwords, it all ends up on the black markets in the uh, in the dark web. And what it means for you is alert IT teams can basically take action. Uh, you can assess your security measures, improve strategies to protect those credentials, obviously enabling MFA to, to make sure that they're not being uh, leveraged. And if you're aware of any users' um, passwords that have been leaked, you can obviously then go ahead and reset those credentials. So there are several databases that are available um, publicly, things like SpyCloud and HaveIBeenPwned.com, where you can put in your single email address and uh, and see whether they've been breached and where they've been breached as well. Um, but what it doesn't give you is, is sort of more of the domain information and even some of the password information. So that's what we've done is we've sort of stepped up that level because of things like this. Businesses, 63% of businesses reported an incident involving the loss of some sensitive information um, in the in the past year. And again, that's just a huge and worrying number if we've got technology out there that can stop this pretty easily. Um, Experian run a report where they've shown um, the price of stealing data, anything from a dollar for a social security number, maybe up to $200 for a PayPal account, et cetera, where they verify that it's got funds or got an active credit card. Um, 
it's available and then monetizing it. So they're going to carry on doing this as well. So WatchGuard introduced a, uh, a free dark web scan where our threat lab teams, the same people that put together that quarterly based report and run the secplicity.org blog, they've put together this tool based on the collection of information that they have found openly on the dark web. They've not paid for any of this information. They've just found this information that contains billions of usernames and passwords. Um, and it gives you the ability to actually scan and find out whether your organization, your email addresses have been breached uh, and allows you to run a report. Even if you've got no breaches today, um, what about tomorrow? What if something did end up on there tomorrow? It's better to be uh, proactive with something like MFA um, and rather than reacting to, uh, to some kind of breach. And that's what the, uh, the, the cloud um, dark web scan will, will offer you. It'll allow you to run a report based on a domain. Um, you can send this to uh, somebody in your organization or um, AEM can run this for you and basically send it to you. It does need to be verified. So for legal reasons, we uh, have been asked by our lawyers to make sure that we have this verified by somebody in your organization with either the email address security, post, web or host master at your domain. And then it can go to an individual. Um, just so we can validate that, that report. You can run it for an individual as well. Um, and you can run this in your if you're a WatchGuard customer today, um, you can go to WatchGuard Cloud and check it for your own domain or a single email address. Uh, and it's also publicly available um, via a website for a single email address. The report will look a little bit like this. Um, so it will contain the, the domain, how many accounts have been breached, where the breach collections have been found and those individual email accounts um, as well. And we can even include um, the first four characters of the password. So this just gives you an idea of, of what the password was that's used. So you can speak to the individuals and be like, hey, are you using this password anymore? Uh, if yes, maybe you want to go ahead and change it. Uh, and if no, great, but we still want to look at sort of introducing some kind of MFA. Um, so check it out for yourselves. Um, you can go to watchguard.com. You can put your uh, your email uh, address in and find out if uh, if it's been exposed. If you're an existing WatchGuard customer, go to WatchGuard Cloud. Uh, when you log in, it's it's there's a tile there on the first window where you can put in your email address or domain. Uh, and obviously speak with ADM as well, who will be able to run this report for you and, and get it sent over. Uh, so over to Isaac, do we have any questions that have come through? Hello, Ollie. Uh, no, you've done pretty well. Uh, we've got limited questions. So if anyone does have any further questions, please do send them to me. My email address is isaac, Isaac at adm-computing.co.uk and I will then forward them over to Ollie to get some answers for you. So no, that's everything from me. Perfect. Well, um, yeah, that's that's it all from me as well. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions afterwards, obviously speak with ADM who will then be able to route them through to myself, um, find me on LinkedIn or whatever. But yeah, thank you very much for everybody's time today. Um, back to you, Isaac. Yes, uh, basically re repetition of that. <laughs> thank you everyone for your time. Um, and again, if you do have any questions for us, please feel free to email me um, and I'll get them answered. And if you have any questions about ADM, same thing goes. So thank you everyone for joining and we'll see you next time.